Over the thousands of years of human history, a few military generals' names continue to echo across the fabric of time. Yet even amongst these Promethean men, few come close to the brilliance of the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Born amidst the picturesque landscapes of Corsica on August 15, 1769, Bonaparte would rise to become a military genius and eventually the French Emperor. His battlefield exploits and strategic prowess would be etched into the chronicles of history. Yet, our focus shifts beyond the theatrics of war to the rocky confines of Elba Island, where Napoleon, once an emperor, was exiled after his first defeat at the hands of the coalition of European powers. This tale transcends the mere evasion of prison walls. It delves into the orchestration of a plan shrouded in the intricacies of deception, mystery, and secrecy. In the shadows of surveillance, Napoleon carefully assembled a group of men loyal to him. Each of these men would play a pivotal role in the audacious escape that would soon captivate the world. The unfolding drama encapsulates meticulous planning and an execution that allowed Napoleon Bonaparte to transcend the confines of Elba Island, etching his name in history as one of the greatest generals the world has ever known. Napoleon's escape wasn't just a physical liberation. It stood as a testament to human ingenuity, resilience, and an indomitable spirit refusing to be fettered. Welcome to another episode of People's Journals. In today's episode, we delve into the life of Napoleon Bonaparte. Moving beyond his legendary battles, we examine the intricacies of his escape from the secluded shores of Elba and his eventual defeat. This episode delves into the threads of a plot that remains one of history's most audacious prison breaks and exposes the strategic brilliance that set Napoleon apart. Before we get into this captivating tale, remember to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and hit the notification bell so you can receive notifications whenever we publish more captivating videos like this one. After years of relentless warfare, the great European powers had finally subdued Napoleon Bonaparte, the indomitable French emperor. They exiled him to the remote confines of Elba, an island nestled off the picturesque coast of Tuscany. This period of isolation was not merely an act of geopolitical banishment, it was the culmination of a tumultuous era in European history. The French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars had raged on since 1792. These wars set France against a succession of European coalitions. The overthrow and execution of Louis XVI had sent shockwaves through the continent and prompted European leaders to crush the revolutionary fervor emanating from France before it spelled trouble. Yet, rather than witnessing France's defeat, the wars had seen the revolutionary regime's territorial expansion and the emergence of a military genius, Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1799, Napoleon orchestrated a successful coup d'etat and seized power as the first consul of the new French consulate. Five years later, he took the imperial crown for himself and proclaimed himself Emperor Napoleon I. This meteoric rise had left Europe deeply unsettled. Despite their best efforts, the French forces continued their relentless march across Europe. However, the turning point came with the ill-fated French invasion of Russia in 1812 that resulted in the catastrophic loss of much of Napoleon's army. In the subsequent year during the War of the Sixth Coalition, the coalition forces achieved a decisive victory in the Battle of Leipzig. Following this pivotal event, the coalition was determined to march on Paris and depose Napoleon. Thus, the stage was set for the events leading to Napoleon's exile to Elba where the defeated emperor would grapple with his fall from grace. At the same time, the victorious powers convened at the Congress of Vienna to reshape the future of Europe. Napoleon's tenure on Elba, a large island off the coast of Tuscany, resulted from his negotiations following his defeat and dethroning in 1814. The Treaty of Fontainebleau, signed on April 11, 1814, imposed harsh terms on Napoleon. While he relinquished his royal property and the right to rule for himself and his descendants, he retained the title of emperor and the unique privilege of selecting his island nation to govern. While Elba was meant to be an exile, it was no ordinary prison. Napoleon deliberately chose Elba for its favorable weather, strategic defenses, and established residences. He took up residence in a villa with harbor views, initially built by the Medicis in the 1700s, 
He also had another summer residence to complement his already lavish lifestyle. Both locations were furnished lavishly and designed for social gatherings and visits, including those of his official overseer, British officer Neil Campbell. Further complicating the island's social dynamics, Napoleon's Polish mistress, Marie Walewska, joined him in exile. However, his ex-wife, Josephine Bonaparte, the Empress of France, until her marriage with him was annulled on January 10, 1810, wasn't on the island with him. Although the exile aimed to keep him away from his supporters worldwide, he was not isolated on the island. He received thousands of letters from well-wishers, friends, accomplices, and supporters. He was also able to keep abreast of events happening worldwide. Interestingly, Napoleon tried to improve the well-being of the island's residents by ordering the building of hospitals and providing drinking water. To keep himself busy, he also spent his time drilling the 400 continental soldiers who had voluntarily followed him into exile. Elba, technically part of France but transformed into a principality by the treaty, became Napoleon's domain. The 86-square-mile island, with its 12,000 residents, granted him sovereignty and property rights. Despite his claims of wanting to live a simple and honest life on the island while tending to his family, house, cows, and mules. It was soon apparent that he had far more grand plans. Marked by the resulting isolation and the relentless watch of his captors, the seeds of an audacious escape plot were sown. And so what appeared to be a subdued chapter of his life was, in fact, a strategic period of plotting one of history's most audacious prison escapes. Despite appearances, the defeated general orchestrated a daring run for freedom in less than a year of captivity. This escape was fueled by a desire to avenge himself against those who had humiliated him by forcing him into exile. Napoleon, despite claiming he was a dead man and that his time of greatness had passed was, in reality, biding his time. Ruling Elba gave him an excuse to build a military force he needed for his escape. He was able to gather a force which included an army of 2,000, a 600-man imperial guard, and a small navy. Frequent communications with France and a continuous stream of visitors aroused the suspicions of the British, who were to watch over him. However, it wasn't until February 26, 1815, that they realized the gravity of these communications. Through these interactions, Napoleon learned of British plans to move him to St. Helena, an island in the South Atlantic. He also discovered that his supporters in France were rebelling against the new king, Louis XVIII. Fearing obscurity and driven by a desire to fulfill what he thought was his destiny, Napoleon supposedly consulted with his mother, who encouraged him to return to France. Seizing the opportunity, Napoleon, with a small fleet of ships, including the disguised brigand Constant, four small transports, and two feluccas, left Elba on February 26th with about 1,150 people aboard. Boldly, he had even informed officials in Elba of his departure. The surprise escape worked flawlessly. It caught the French off guard, rendered the English ineffective, and elicited ecstatic support from Napoleon's followers. Arriving in Golfe Juan, France, on March 1, 1815, Napoleon embarked on a triumphant journey to Paris. He was able to return to Paris on March 20, 1815. Paris welcomed him with celebration, and Louis XVIII, the new king, fled to Belgium. With Louis only just gone, Napoleon moved back into the Tuileries. At the Congress of Vienna, where the European powers were meeting to discuss how to rearrange Europe in the aftermath of Napoleon's conquests, news of Napoleon's escape from Elba was delivered to them. On March 13, 1815, the nations represented there declared Napoleon an outlaw. Napoleon began to make minor and hollow reforms to restore his reputation and garner support from the populace. These reforms, he promised, would grant the citizens a more liberal and democratic society. One such shady reform was the so-called Additional Act to the Constitution of the Empire. Despite his best efforts, however, people soon realized the duplicity of these reforms and his support base continued to decline. His second reign, which only lasted a hundred days, was soon to end in disgraceful defeat and permanent exile to a much rougher island. The grand tale of Napoleon Bonaparte's life took an abrupt and dramatic turn at the Battle of Waterloo on June 18, 1815. Napoleon's return to power during the Hundred Days 
also known as the War of the Seventh Coalition, had reignited European tensions. These events would eventually culminate in the famous Battle of Waterloo that spelled his defeat. Facing a coalition of European forces led by the Duke of Wellington and Gebhard Leberecht von Blücher, Napoleon suffered a resounding loss that marked the end of his ambitions for European domination. Napoleon's return from Elba set the stage for a dramatic military mobilization during the Hundred Days. During this period, the coalition nations and Napoleon prepared for a resumption of hostilities and, potentially, a full-scale war. Upon reassuming the throne, Napoleon realized that Louis XVI had left him with a depleted treasury and few resources. However, not to be deterred, he swiftly moved to consolidate his military strength. By the end of May, Napoleon already had an armed force of 198,000 soldiers at his disposal, with an additional $66,000 in training. The centerpiece of this formidable force was l'Armée du Nord, the Army of the North, personally led by Napoleon, who played a pivotal role in the coming Waterloo Campaign. To defend France, Napoleon strategically deployed his remaining forces within the country. He aimed to delay foreign adversaries while suppressing domestic opposition. He organized his forces meticulously and distributed them as follows. 6th Corps, l'Armée du Rhin, commanded by Rapp and stationed near Strasbourg. 7th Corps, l'Armée des Alpes, commanded by Suchet and cantoned at Lyon. The 1st Corps of Observation, l'Armée du Jura, commanded by Le Courbe and stationed at Belfort. The 2nd Corps of Observation, l'Armée du Var, commanded by Brune and also based at Toulon. The 3rd Corps of Observation, Army of the Pyrenees Orientales, commanded by De Cayenne, based at Toulouse. The 4th Corps of Observation, Army of the Pyrenees Occidentales, commanded by Clausel, based at Bordeaux. And the Army of the West, Armée de l'Ouest, which was commanded by Lamarck and created to suppress the Royalist insurrection in the Vendée region. On the opposing side, the coalition forces, sensing the renewed threat posed by Napoleon, also began to mobilize extensively. Archduke Charles, Prince of Schwarzenberg, King Ferdinand VII of Spain, Tsar Alexander I of Russia, and Prussia rallied their forces to form a formidable army. Assessed as immediate threats by Napoleon were the Anglo-Allied forces commanded by Wellington and the Prussian army under Gebhard Leberecht von Blücher, who were both stationed close to Brussels. Simultaneously, the German Corps, part of Blücher's army, acted independently south of the main Prussian force. Other coalition forces, such as the Austrian Army of the Upper Rhine, the Swiss Army, the Austrian Army of Upper Italy, and the Austrian Army of Naples, added to the complexity of the geopolitical landscape. The Congress of Vienna, attended by the great powers of Europe, swiftly declared Napoleon an outlaw on March 13, 1815 thus signaling the commencement of the War of the Seventh Coalition. Hopes of a peaceful resolution evaporated, and pledged 150,000 men yield such numbers due to its smaller standing army and global commitments. Compensize. The invasion of France was planned for July 1, 1815. This date was later than desired by critical figures like Blücher and Wellington. The delay aimed to synchronize the coalition armies, presenting a united front against Napoleon. However, that had the effect of giving Napoleon enough time to fortify his forces and defenses. Confronted with the decision of a defensive or offensive campaign, Napoleon opted for the latter. To him, launching a preemptive strike against the coalition before they could convene was the most viable path to victory. His strategy was to force the coalition powers into peace negotiations favorable to France. Napoleon's decision to attack Belgium was strategically driven, taking advantage of dispersed British and Prussian armies and political opportunities in French-speaking Brussels. From June 15 to July 8, 1815, the Waterloo Campaign unfolded as the most pivotal moment of the Hundred Days. Initially led by Napoleon, the French Army of the North faced the Anglo-Allied army commanded by the Duke of Wellington and the Prussian army led by Prince Blücher. Hostilities ignited on June 15th when the French secured a central position at the Sambre. That set the stage for the battles of Quatre Bras and Ligny on June 16th. Marshal Ney led the left wing at Quatre Bras, while Napoleon defeated Blücher at Ligny. After a brief interlude on June 17th, where Napoleon left Grouchy to pursue the Prussians, the Battle of Waterloo began properly on June 18th, 1815. The Anglo-Allied army, 
resolute against French attacks, eventually triumphed, with Prussian support sealing the fate of the French forces. Following his defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon chose not to rally with the army, but returned to Paris to secure political support. While being pursued by coalition forces, the French provisional government authorized capitulation terms that led to the Convention of St. Cloud on July 4th. The coalition forces entered Paris on July 7th, marking the end of all hostilities. Louis XVI, the French king who had previously been exiled on Napoleon's second return, was restored to the throne on July 8th and Napoleon faced the inevitability of surrender. Unable to remain in France or escape, he surrendered to Captain Frederick Maitland on the HMS Bellerophon on July 15, 1815. Thus, the Hundred Days came to a close, leaving an indelible mark on the pages of history. Defeated and captured by the coalition forces, Napoleon faced a new fate. The Allies, fearing his ability to rally supporters and disrupt the European balance of power again, opted for a more remote and formidable prison. After much deliberation, it was settled that he would be exiled to the island of St. Helena. The decision to exile Napoleon, there was a punitive mesure and a calculated strategic move. Situated in the South Atlantic, approximately 1-200 miles off, the coast of southwestern Africa, St. Helena was a rocky and inhospitable outpost. The British, who held him captive, aimed to ensure that he remained far removed from the European continent and any potential sympathizers, allies, and loyalists. On October 15, 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte, accompanied by a British naval escort, embarked on the HMS Northumberland for his journey to exile. Arriving in St. Helena, Napoleon was confronted with the harsh realities of his confinement. Due to the island's isolation in the vast expanse of the South Atlantic, St. Helena offered little to no respite to the defeated general. Only 47 square miles, the island presented a challenging terrain with cliffs, rugged landscapes, and a lack of suitable harbors, conditions that would test even the most resilient spirit. Restrictive measures marked Napoleon's exile in St. Helena. His movements were closely monitored, and he was subjected to constant surveillance by his British captors. The climatic and geographic challenges of St. Helena added to the complexity of Napoleon's daily life. The island's unpredictable weather, characterized by strong winds and frequent rain, made outdoor activities difficult. There were little to no resources for him to build an army that could help him escape like he had before. The residence he was provided, known as Longwood House, became his cage. The allure of Napoleon's charisma and military genius persisted despite his defeat. His tumultuous love affairs, daring escapes, and meteoric rise to power continued to captivate the imagination of generations to come. Even as he languished on St. Helena, his shadow loomed large over the political landscape of Europe. As the years unfolded on St. Helena, so did the health of the fallen emperor. His captivity's isolation and harsh conditions took a toll on his once small yet robust frame. On May 5, 1821, Napoleon Bonaparte drew his final breath. The man who had once commanded armies and reshaped nations succumbed to the solitude of exile and stomach cancer, brought about by an ulcer. Yet even in death, Napoleon's legacy endured. His impact on the world was profound and lasting. The Napoleonic Code, his legal masterpiece, became a foundation for modern legal systems. The administrative reforms he implemented in conquered regions left a lasting imprint on governance. As an homage to his meteoric rise from nigh grass to emperor, the idea of a merit-based society where one's achievements could elevate one's status became a guiding principle in many nations. We've come to the end of today's video. Once again, thank you for tuning in as we narrated French General. Napoleon Bonaparte's daring escape from his island of exile. Remember to give this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to stay updated on new captivating content from People's Journals.